Minerals, energy and agriculture, now more than ever, are vital to Australia's clean energy future, economic growth and prosperity. Since 2016, Geoscience Australia has applied science and technology in new ways through the Exploring for the Future program. By gathering, analysing and interpreting data at unprecedented scale and detail, we're building a national picture of Australia's geology and resource potential. So how do we know where to look for potential minerals, energy and groundwater buried deep underground? By analysing rock samples and water percolating up from below, measuring signals from earthquakes and lightning strikes, surveying and mapping with aircraft and seismic trucks. We are looking, listening, monitoring and recording what the Earth is telling us. We look across the country and image hundreds of metres below the surface to create a picture of what lies below our feet, resulting in a new generation of maps and data. Each set of data we acquire is valuable in itself, but when we overlay the data sets together in a way no one has done before, we start to see the full picture and gain a greater understanding of where we can make new discoveries. Australia has become a world leader in the science and innovation behind resource exploration. We're placing data directly into the hands of the people who need it. Governments and local decision makers, investors, explorers and regional communities. Supporting informed decisions that make a real difference to all Australians. We thank the people and communities who collaborate with us to ensure the success of our program. Together, our work is supporting the transition to a sustainable, clean energy future, building tomorrow's industries and stimulating regional economies to ensure the prosperity of future generations. Well, welcome. Uh, you've made it to the last session of day three of the 2024 Exploring for the Future program showcase. My name's Anthony Schofield, and I'm the Director of the Mineral Potential of Australia section here at Geoscience Australia. Um, and I'll be hosting you for this session, which is titled Towards a National Inventory of Resource Potential and Sustainable Development. Uh, but before we begin, I just want to um, start by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people who have lived and shared culture in the Canberra region for many thousands of years. Uh, I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and I also recognise our First Nations partners and traditional custodians of the lands that we have accessed throughout this program. Uh, finally, I want to extend a warm welcome to all First Nations Australians who might be joining us today. So, um, so we've been through a lot so far. Yesterday we heard about mapping the physical, chemical and geological properties of the Australian tectonic plate. And so far today, um, we've heard all about hydrogen and basin and hosted resources of groundwater, um, source rocks and carbon dioxide storage. Um, if you missed out on the session, um, you'll want to go back and watch it. Um, or if you would like to access any of the outputs that we're releasing, um, you can find links to those on the showcase webpage. Um, but it's important to note that the work that we're showcasing is only made possible through extensive collaboration. And there's a lot of collaborators, um, and we sincerely thank them all for their valuable contributions. So in this last session today, we'll focus on growing a national inventory of mineral resources. We're going to start by identifying potential for new discoveries of minerals. Uh, we'll look at then unlocking the potential of critical mineral supply from mine waste at the deposits that we already know and love. And we'll consider spatial information relating to environmental, social and governance factors to support informed resource exploration and development. Uh, following the presentations, there'll be a chance for you to, um, to ask questions in a QA and a session um, and the presenters will be available um, and you can, ask, uh, you can post your questions using the Q&A stream at the top of your screen. Um, the speakers are of course presenting on behalf of a huge team including scientists, administrators and other professionals. Um, if they don't get a chance to answer your questions, uh, we're more than happy to take them on notice via email at EFTF at ga.gov.au. So our first speaker today is Dr. Ariane Ford, who will present towards a national inventory of mineral potential. Um, Ariane is a geoscientist in my team, and I'm very proud of her, um, whose focus is on the use of spatial statistics and machine learning for evaluating mineral potential using mineral systems based approaches. Um, Ariane joined Geoscience Australia in 2022 as activity leader for integration and prospectivity 
and before that um, previously worked extensively in both academia and industry. Um, thank you, Ariane. So thank you for that introduction. I'll be speaking to you today about the progress that we are making towards the development of a national inventory of mineral potential, focused on delivering pre-competitive geoscience to help support the transition to net zero by 2050. As many people will have heard by now, one of the main challenges with critical minerals is around downstream parts of the value chain, in particular around processing. However, this work is focused on the upstream component and looking at what can be done to help support the discovery of the feedstock required for that critical minerals processing to occur. The graph in the top right shows the projected increased growth in demand to meet net zero emissions for a number of critical and strategic minerals, which demonstrates why new discoveries will be needed to meet this demand. As part of the Exploring for the Future program, we've been focused on undertaking mineral potential assessments for the mineral systems that contain these critical and strategic minerals as either primary commodities or as buy or co-products. You can see in the bottom right how these commodities feed into the manufacture of technology that will help support the net zero transition. Currently, we have a specific emphasis on prediction under cover where that is relevant because we acknowledge that some mineral systems will be sufficient and the undercover component will be less relevant. The national scale mineral potential assessments undertaken as part of the Exploring for the Future program build off the nickel copper platinum group element assessment published in 2016. So we've undertaken new assessments for sediment hosted base metals, carbonatite related rare earth elements and iron oxide copper gold mineral systems each of which contain critical or strategic minerals that will help to support the government's critical minerals strategy and the transition to net zero. So mineral potential mapping, it looks to predictively model the geologically prospective regions for different mineral systems. And this is undertaken by synthesizing large volumes of pre-competitive geoscience data with mineral systems expertise. And this includes both legacy and new pre-competitive data. And we look at translating the physical and chemical processes for the mineral systems formation into mappable criteria that we can map spatial proxies for from our available data. As part of this process, we're able to evaluate the predictive power of individual data sets and the mineral potential map that is produced. We're also able to develop data uncertainty maps, which indicate which areas might have higher uncertainty due to missing data or information in the data sets. We also have multiple end users for these products. So although the mineral potential maps have a clear end use by the exploration industry, it's also worth highlighting here that they have utility in helping to support land use decision-making by government. And this is especially important with the government committing to protecting and conserving 30% of Australia's land and marine areas by 2030. I'll now talk briefly through the mineral potential assessments that we have produced under the Exploring for the Future program and how we'll be using this as a basis for delivering a national inventory of, of mineral potential going forwards. So to start with, let's look at the sediment hosted zinc mineral systems. These are important for Australia as they contain about 84% of Australia's pre-mining zinc resources and about 85% of the lead resources. In addition, they also contain or produce a number of critical minerals as co-products or byproducts, including gallium, germanium, indium, cobalt and nickel. This particular assessment leverages off previous work at Geoscience Australia, which looked at the lithospheric controls on sediment hosted base metal mineral systems. The table here shows the mineral systems components and the theoretical and mappable criteria used to represent spatial proxies for the physical and chemical processes in the system. I'm not going to discuss this slide in detail, but I note that we've separated the sediment hosted zinc lead assessment into four separate mineral systems. Clastic dominated siliciclastic carbonate, clastic dominated siliciclastic mafic, Mississippi Valley type and Irish type. And as I said on the previous slide, this assessment is built off the back of work looking at lithospheric controls on sediment hosted base metal mineral systems. In particular, the work that Mark Hoggard led that looks at the relationship between these systems and the lithosphere-asthenosphere boundary. 
which you would have heard more about earlier in the showcase in Mark's talk. So we've integrated this with a series of other criteria to see where else in Australia we could be looking to discover these mineral systems. I also include a QR code at the end of this presentation, which links you to our Exploring for the Future Mineral Potential Mapping webpage, which includes links to all the reports and data packages produced, so you can get more detail on the assessments. So the mineral potential maps for the four sediment hosted zinc lead systems are shown here, along with a simple validation metric. The graph on the right shows what is called a receiver operator characteristic curve. On the x-axis, we have the area of Australia, and on the y-axis, the cumulative number of deposits contained within that area. So as the prospectivity values decrease from one, the amount of area covered increases. So what we're trying to do with the mineral potential maps is capture the most number of deposits in the smallest amount of area for each mineral system that we model. The closer each line is to the top left, the better, because it's predicting more deposits in a smaller amount of area. This gives the area under the curve values closer to one. The diagonal is essentially equivalent to random chance, so we want to be as far above that line as possible to help reduce our exploration search space. And so what we're trying to do is basically optimise where the best trade-off occurs between the area and deposit capture. So we can say this is where we're going to get the best reduction in our exploration search space for our model. So you can see here that we've been able to reduce the exploration search space by up to about 85%. We know here that we couldn't do this for the Irish type system because we didn't have enough identified deposits to generate the graph and calculate any statistics. I'll now move on to the sediment hosted copper mineral potential assessment. These systems are important not only for their copper resources, but because they're also an important source of critical minerals such as cobalt and germanium. These are a type of copper system that we're wanting to find more of in Australia because they're typically high grade, low tonnage deposits. And deposits like these can have a smaller environmental footprint than other types of copper deposit that may be more low grade, high tonnage. So as part of this assessment, although we've reviewed each of the two copper systems separately, so the sediment hosted stratiform copper and the Mount Isa type copper systems, we've combined them into a single mineral potential map due to the number of similarities between them. On this slide, I want to highlight that although we've reviewed the sediment hosted stratiform copper and Isa type copper systems separately, we've modelled them together to produce a single mineral potential map. Again, this was an assessment that built off the work of Mark Hoggard on the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary, which was integrated with other data sets such as lead isotope maps that have formed part of ongoing work that Geoscience Australia pioneered on national scale isotope mapping, which helps us understand the evolution of the continent. You can hear more about the Isotopic Atlas of Australia in the showcase presentation by Jeff Fraser. So here we have one of the results from the sediment hosted copper mineral potential assessment. And you can see here the result with the validation information, which was used to determine the reduction in the exploration search space. So the model produces an area under the curve of about 0.8, which reduces our exploration search space by about 80%. Now to just briefly look at the carbonatite related rare earth element mineral system. These are an important source globally of rare earth elements, but they're also an important source of niobium and yttrium. This particular assessment leverages off the Australian Alkaline Rocks Atlas, which was also developed under the Exploring for the Future program. And you can hear more about the atlas in the showcase presentation by Guillaume Sanchez. This assessment has focused particularly on modeling the magmatic component of the mineral system. However, we acknowledge that in Australia, higher grade mineralisation typically sits in the laterite cover above the primary carbonatite source. However, in order for that upgrading of the rare earths to occur, the primary source still needs to be present. So we've focused on modelling that in the assessment. Here I'd like to make note that the mineral potential assessment for the carbonatite related rare earth mineral system is heavily focused on the use of geophysics to map mantle processes that are key for the formation of this mineral system. This makes use of many legacy geophysical data sets from Geoscience Australia that have been acquired in collaboration with the State and Territory Geological Surveys. We're unable to produce these national scale data sets without their support. So we thank them for the successful collaborations that we continue to maintain. Again, 
I'd also like to note here the use of the Alkaline Rocks data set, which was delivered as part of the Exploring for the Future program, both as an input data set to look at the alkaline silicate rocks, but we also use carbonatites that were mapped in that data set to validate our model. This particular assessment delivered two separate mineral potential maps. Model one includes just three of the four mineral systems components and is specifically focused on targeting undercover. So just includes the source drivers and lithospheric architecture components. Whereas the second model includes all four components, which also includes the addition of the ore deposition component. However, we note that the ore deposition component is based off sufficient geochemistry data so it does have a slight bias towards sufficient rare earth mineralization. Since we've released the results of this particular assessment, there have been an additional two carbonatite related rare earth element discoveries that are located in areas of high prospectivity in the West Arunta region in Western Australia. You can see here where they're located. So while we're not claiming that this model contributed to the discoveries, it's a great additional validation that our models are on the right track. A key thing to note for this assessment is that we changed tack a little bit from the sediment hosted base metal mineral potential maps I just discussed and implemented a new statistically driven methodology for feature engineering the input maps, quantifying their predictive importance and providing weighting factors for each of the inputs. This methodology uses the Kolmogorov Smirnov test to evaluate the probability that the deposit distribution is random relative to the map being tested and provides guidance on how to optimise feature engineering for the input maps. This has allowed us to move from a predefined buffer around a feature to looking at proximity to features using a data driven approach. Again, we've validated the models using the area under the curve metric which produce values around 0.9 and has reduced the exploration search space for each model up to around 90%. So we're getting excellent results from these models. Now to the recently released iron oxide copper gold or IOCG mineral potential assessment. IOCGs are the main source of copper in Australia, but are also important sources for cobalt, rare earth elements and uranium. We acknowledge that there's a lot of debate about the formation of IOCG mineral systems but for the purposes of this assessment, we've implemented a single mineral system model that doesn't differentiate between the subtypes such as Cloncurry type, Olympic Dam type IOCGs. Here you can see the criteria that are fed into the National IOCG assessment. I note here the number of new data sets that were used in this model that were developed under the Exploring for the Future program, including new national layered solar geology, which you can hear about in the showcase presentation by Guillaume Sanchez, a new model of metasomatized mantle, which you can hear more about in Mark Hoggard's talk. A new Auslamp magnetotellurics model, which Jingming Duan spoke about earlier in the showcase. And a new MOHO model, and a major update to the major crustal boundaries data set, which you can hear more about in Alexei Gorbatov's presentation. And although he's not delivering a presentation on it during the showcase, the model also includes new national scale magnetics and gravity inversions from James Goodwin, which are available for download from Geoscience Australia's data and publications catalogue. Here you can see the new IOCG mineral potential map and its associated validation metrics using the area under the curve metric, which shows that the model is reducing the exploration search space by around 92%. The mineral potential map is showing high prospectivity in the main IOCG districts around Cloncurry in northwest Queensland, in the Gawler Craton in South Australia, and in the Tennant Creek mineral field in the Northern Territory. However, we also note the high prospectivity in the Halls Creek region in Western Australia, as well as parts of the Tanami in the Northern Territory and parts of the Kernamona in New South Wales and South Australia. So we've been working on these mineral potential assessments using a mineral systems based approach. However, to generate a national inventory of mineral potential, we want to translate this into maps of commodity potential. This will be part of our forward work program under the Resourcing Australia's Prosperity Initiative, where we will need to develop maps of Australia's potential for all of the commodities on Australia's critical and strategic minerals lists. I'm just going to highlight one of the preliminary maps that we've made, which shows one approach that we might take to do this. So for copper, we now have national scale assessments for iron oxide copper gold, 
sediment hosted copper and nickel copper platinum group element mineral systems. So these are the models produced to date that contain copper as a significant commodity. So we assess the Australian pre-mining resources for each of these modelled systems and log transform this value to calculate the percent of the total for each system. We then weight each of the mineral potential maps based on that percentage and sum them together. So you can see here the preliminary copper potential map of Australia. I want to note that this is just one potential approach that we can use for doing this. We could also look at using global resources or information in the Critical Minerals in Ores database that was developed under the Critical Minerals Mapping Initiative in collaboration with the US and Canadian Geological Surveys. Now we're aware that some significant copper mineral systems haven't been modelled yet, such as porphyry copper and VMS. These will be looked at in due course and the results will be integrated into the copper potential map. And we're also in the process of updating the mineral deposit data with up-to-date resource information. So we expect the final copper potential map will look a bit different to what you can see here on the slide. So the national scale mineral potential maps produced under the Exploring for the Future program illustrate high prospectivity in different parts of Australia for critical and strategic minerals that will help support the transition to net zero. And while it's always good to predict known districts for a given mineral system, importantly, each of the mineral potential maps shows high prospectivity in areas with no previously identified mineralisation related to the mineral system. I feel like it's important to note here the move towards using statistical data-driven approaches for the mineral potential mapping. This has provided us with guidance on effective feature engineering of the input maps and how we weight those maps which subsequently allows us to rank the importance of different data sets. And this allows us to focus our efforts more effectively. As I pointed out when discussing the copper commodity map in the previous slide, we know that other mineral systems also contain the critical and strategic minerals that we will need to support the transition to net zero. So we'll be looking to model these systems in due course to build towards a national commodity-based inventory of mineral potential. In terms of our future work, uh, I also want to note that this is not a one and done exercise. Updates to the mineral potential maps shown here today will happen in due course as the underlying data sets are updated. For example, the sediment hosted base metal mineral potential assessments were undertaken before the new national layered solar geology was available. And we would include updated seismic and magnetotelluric models in all of the assessments as those surveys continue to acquire and release data. We'll also look to combine these maps of geological potential with techno-economic models through economic fairways, which you will have previously heard about in the showcase presentation by Marcus Haynes, as well as mapping of the environmental, social and governance factors, which you will hear about shortly from Eleanor Lebray. We also hope to learn more about which mineral systems contain some of the more niche critical minerals through work being undertaken as part of mine waste studies, which you'll hear about in the next talk from Anita Parbica Fox. The QR code on this slide here will take you to our Exploring for the Future Mineral Potential Mapping webpage, which includes links to all of our data packages and publications for all of the mineral potential assessments that I've discussed here today. The mineral potential maps can be also be accessed by the Exploring for the Future Data Discovery Portal as either static maps, or we now have most of them available through our mineral potential mapper tool. Here's a quick video of how to access the tool via the portal. If you go to the tools menu in the upper right and scroll down to the mineral potential mapper tool, you can then select your region of interest. Here I'm just picking all of Australia, you can then select which mineral system you want to model and modify the weights for each map if you don't like the weights we've used in our published versions. You can also turn inputs on and off if you disagree with some of the maps that we've included. You're then able to download the various products once it's been run. The tool is now online for all of the national scale assessments except for the IOCG mineral system, which hopefully won't be too far away. Lastly, I'd just like to thank the huge team of people who have been involved in this work. Although I'm the one presenting this today, it's really been a huge team effort. So I'd like to thank the entire Mineral Potential Mapping team, the staff in Information Systems who have helped us with code development and getting everything online, and the cartography team for helping us make great images. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. 
Well, thanks, Ariane. That was great. Um, what I really love about it is seeing how all these new data sets that we, we looked at yesterday, um, how they can come and be brought together to, um, to give us a new understanding of where resource potential is across Australia, um, particularly in those frontier areas, and how we can build towards commodity potential maps. So really well done. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Anita Parbakar fox uh, who will now present towards an inventory of mine waste potential. Um, Anita is a Principal Research Fellow in Geometallurgy and Applied Geochemistry and Group Leader for Mine Waste Transformation through Characterization, uh, or MyWatch, at the Sustainable Minerals Institute's WH Bryan Mining Geology Research Centre at the University of Queensland. Um, Anita's research is focused on mine waste characterization to improve mine planning and waste management practices, uh, where she has worked with the mining industry, met sector and government stakeholders. Thank you, Anita. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for having me today at the EFTF showcase. Uh, my name's Associate Professor Anita Pavaka fox and I'm delighted to give this presentation on behalf of many collaborators and what I'm going to be talking about today is how we've, how we've been working towards a national inventory of mine waste potential across Australia. So before I begin, I just want to acknowledge the many collaborators who've been working in this project. So across the University of Queensland, we've had the MyWatch team, uh, and in this particular project led by Cam Bawani. Um, at RMIT University, we've had uh, Professor Gavin Mudd and his team, and down at Monash University, we've had Stuart Walsh and his team as well. And we've been very fortunate in this project to be working with many different state collaborators because this project wouldn't have been possible without that tremendous amount of collaborative work across Australia from these different surveys. And we've also had the opportunity to have many companies also support this work too. So a big thank you to all of the many collaborators who've worked on this project because it's really important. I mean, if we think about mine waste in Australia, we have a mine waste problem. I mean, what you're looking at here is a map that really sort of shows across the country. And it was produced in 2020, so it's a little bit out of date. But certainly what Tim Werner and his team did was they went to each of the state government survey databases and they pulled together a list of all the active and inactive mine sites that we have across the country. And what you can see there is there are literally tens of thousands of sites that we have here in Australia, all of which contain mine waste features. And that's what you're looking at in all of these different maps here. So we can see we've got all of this mine waste sitting on the surface of Australia and we have to do something with it. I mean, as a country, we've been talking about mine, well, we've been talking about mine waste for a long time now, but certainly we've been thinking about circular economy opportunities in our other industries like plastics, textiles, furniture, all sorts of things. And we've seen tremendous efforts made in terms of circular economy in those sectors. But what are we doing with our mine waste? And that was really one of the drivers of this collaborative research project that we're, we're sort of going to be talking about in the next little while here. And, you know, this really is a problem that we have to think about as we move forward and we actually start to address um, climate change. I mean, obviously, as a global community, we've been talking a lot more about the green economy, pushing towards renewable energies and all of these energy transition technologies. And we can see many examples of, of those energy transition technologies listed here. But as Richard Harrington pointed out uh, back in 2021 in his article in Nature, he very nicely kind of articulated and summarised the fact that if we're going to move towards you know, the energy transition and we're going to sort of be less reliant on fossil fuels, we are going to have to mine more materials. We are going to have to open more and more mines. And if we're going to have to open more and more mines, we're going to have to manage more and more mine waste. And for us as, a, as an Australian society, as a global community, this is a problem because if we actually continue to manage our mine waste materials in the manner that we have in the past, we could see growing examples of, you know, catastrophic tailings down failures and other things. I mean, we all saw those images of Brumadinho back in 2019 and indeed uh, Mount Poli in 2014 and Samarco in 2015, but they're not just examples of things that happen overseas. I mean, we've had examples of tailing storage failures here in Australia too. So if you cast your mine back to 2018, for example, down in New South Wales at the Cadia mine, there was a tailing storage dam failure there. Now, this was, um, you know, this failure was essentially due to liquefaction of the lower sedimentary layers within that TSF. But it goes to show that these types of activities and failures can happen in our very own country. And if we're going to mine more, we're going to produce more tailings, which means that examples like this, they could become more and more common in our Australian landscape. 
And one of the other major risks associated with mine waste materials is obviously the formation of acid and metalliferous drainage. Now, this is caused by the oxidation of sulfide minerals, which can commonly sit within our mine waste materials. And on oxidation, they can release acid into ecosystems. And so there's obviously a very famous example here in Australia, Mount Lyle. This is obviously associated with historic mining. And obviously, you know, back in the day where waste practices were not quite where they're at today, um, these sorts of impacts can, can occur. So that low pH water actually enters into the Queen River system via haulage creek. And, you know, for the length of that river down to the King River Delta, we see that the system is actually aquatically dead. Now, if you actually look at this water, you can think of it in a different way, because sitting within this acid and metal of drainage, we have elevated copper, we have elevated arsenic, cadmium, etc. And these are all things that could be quite easily recovered using available technologies. So perhaps there's an opportunity here to turn this kind of potential problem into a big success story using new technologies. So something to think about. So that's the challenge that we have. And so, you know, this collaborative effort, what have we done to move towards a solution? Well, motivated by a couple of things, certainly obviously the tragedies of the past that we saw in terms of geotechnical failures, but also the critical mineral strategy and the circular economy have been two things that have been game changers when it comes to thinking about mine waste and how we manage that moving forward. And so what we've often found when we've gone out and characterised mine waste materials is that there's a whole host of you know, metals that we've identified contained in these mine waste materials. We've recognised this countless times in these environmental studies, but now, because of the critical mineral strategy, we're actually looking at our mine waste in a completely different way, because, you know, time and time again, we've observed things like elevated cadmium, elevated arsenic, elevated antimony and bismuth, but all of a sudden, these are things that are of critical mineral strategy. So how we're viewing waste is really changing, because now we can appreciate that these could be potential resources for the future to fuel the development of those technologies that we need for the energy transition. And Australia really is committed to growing its circular economy. I mean, you know, I can't tell you how many billion dollars that we would like to hit by the time, you know, it's 2030 in terms of the amount of contribution from the circular economy, but it is something that as a global community and indeed a national community that we're moving towards. And here we have mine waste materials that could deliver into the, uh, into the circular economy. So we have a big opportunity here to actually revisit how we look at mine waste and actually instead of seeing it as a liability, we can now start seeing it as a potential asset. And that really was kind of the motivation for a lot of this collaborative research that we've undertaken over these past few years with, uh, with the collaborators listed on the first slide. So, you know, particularly uh, the Queensland team and the RMI team, what we've done is we've come up with a mechanism or a manner by which we can actually go out and assess these mine waste materials. And so what you're looking at here are our secondary prospectivity workflows. And so we've divided them into three streams of research. Stream one is where we go out and we do a first pass investigation to really characterise what's sitting in those mine waste materials. So it's um, it's an integrated programme, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. But you know we can also go back to these sites and do very detailed site investigations. So that's the time where we might you know bring in drilling rigs, um, collect systematic samples, and actually collect enough data so we can actually start to do some modelling of the mine waste resources that could potentially be at a potential mine waste site. And at stream three, that's where we can take materials from stream one or stream two and actually start to do some mineral processing uh, test work because there's no point in just identifying if that material is sitting there. We actually need to then develop the technologies and work out the flow sheets to actually crack out that value. And so that's kind of the, the secondary prospectivity workflows that we've been um, kind of working within this collaborative project. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about our stream one research program. And so what happens in stream one, uh, as I said previously, we go out to these sites and we do mine waste sampling. And of course, you know, how do we sample these materials? And I'm, I'm not going to lie, it's not necessarily easy. And you have to design a new sampling campaign program based on the new waste types that you encounter. So in this program, it hasn't just been tailings. We've looked at waste materials in terms of waste rock. We've looked at slag materials. We've looked at spent heat leach. We've even looked at coal mine waste and coal residues. And each of these things requires different ways in which you know, you're going to actually take those samples. The method that we've used, you know, for mine tailings, for example, has been very simple. We've taken hand augers out to site, and those hand augers have been pivotal in terms of actually helping us to actually collect deeper samples. So in some cases, we've been able to actually collect samples from up to 10 metres depth, which, you know, is quite a good thing to do in this kind of first-pass campaign. 
once we've got those samples, we put it into an assay program where we assay for 48 different elements. And this gives us very good insight into the critical metal and the rare earth element content of those materials. Now, one thing that's you know commonly overlooked when we see kind of um, people from industry going to do this type of work is they don't necessarily always think about the mineralogy, but actually understanding the mineralogy is absolutely pivotal to actually understanding what the value is within those waste materials and how indeed they can be recovered. So I'm all about the mineralogy. We have to integrate you know, bulk mineralogy observations in situ, but also the mineral chemistry. So if you've got all of this kind of information sitting in front of you, you then can start to understand if there is the potential to remine that material and extract critical metal or metals or minerals. And it will also help you choose the right reprocessing technology. So that's the Stream 1 program. And we've been super busy with all of our collaborators working across the country. And so what you're looking at there is the final map of my watch or, or University of Queensland sites that have been um, studied in this program. And so we were really fortunate to kick off this type of work with the Queensland State Government back in 2019. And so by the end of program, which is uh, December 24 for us, we're going to have sampled 44 sites undertaking Stream 1 programs. And we've done three Stream 2 um, site investigations as well. Now, following on from Queensland, uh, Geoscience Australia became uh, involved in this program where we undertook 10 Stream 1 sites and two Stream 2 sites. So we had a slightly different um, objective with GA. What we wanted to do was actually sample, you know, different sites representative of different ore systems to really get a flavour of what that signature of waste is associated with some of Australia's uh, major um, ore types. And so in that regard, uh, the sites that we selected for studying with GA were um, state agnostic, which has been great to really supplement some of the work we've done in the Northern Territory and Western Australia in particular. Now, with, um, with the New South Wales government, again, we've been very fortunate to study a number of sites. So we, at by end of programme, we studied 21 sites and those will be delivered, um, I think, in August 2024 this year. And there'll be publicly released that data. And certainly we had an opportunity there to look at both coal and metalliferous mine waste sites in, uh, in equal measure. So that's, um, that's going to be a good data set to deliver. And after that, certainly the Northern Territories and the, um, the Geological Survey of South Australia became involved too. So in the Northern Territories, we managed to do four stream one sites and we'll, we'll focus a little bit on, on a site from the Northern Territories in a little while. And down in GA, uh, GSSA, sorry, in South Australia, um, what we did there was we kicked off the program first by doing a bit of a scan of what was already existing in terms of the SARI database. And working with their state government, we developed a ranking criteria to help us prioritise which sites we were actually going to go back and do invasive stream one sampling at. And that was actually a really sensible approach to help us kind of pick out some of the, you know, the most prospective sites for in terms of both critical metal content, but also thinking about a, a few other sort of um, parameters relating to, you know, processability. And finally, uh, we kicked off a program with the Western Australian Survey just last year. And there we've been really fortunate to study um, a couple of sites, certainly Elverton down in the south, but also Ellendale up in the north here. And we're going to be going back to Elverton, uh, Ellendale um, next month. And that's the site where we're looking at diamond mine tailings. And so for us, that's actually a new waste type for us to look at. And from the, um, the reconnaissance survey that we did earlier in the year, we took a few grab samples there, but what we saw was an elevated signature of rare earth elements. So immediately, you know, it, it goes to show that, you know, sometimes you can turn up with the unexpected in some ways. So, you know, we've been very well supported by, by these various state governments and, and, and indeed GA to undertake this program. But we've also had the opportunity to work, you know, with industry more one on one as well. So, you know, certainly it's been great to see that motivated by this collaborative research, the companies are now taking notice and also wanting to characterise their waste in a very similar manner using the Stream 1, the Stream 2 or the Stream 3 uh, methodologies. So I can only imagine, you know, if I give this talk again in a year or two's time that we're going to have many more logos on there because slowly, slowly, but definitely surely, our industry is waking up to the fact that there's a big opportunity there sitting in their waste and we could definitely grow Australia's secondary prospectivity sector quite rapidly in the next decade. So that's what we've been doing. Um, I'm not going to have time to talk about the results from all of the sites, but you know, certainly if you are interested to learn a little bit more about some of the results, there's a snapshot of some of the reports that are soon to be available for download. So I urge you to go and have a look at those. But what I am going to do is spend the next little while talking about one particular metal and that's cobalt. So when we kicked off the program with the Queensland State Government, we did have a bit of a focus on cobalt. We wanted to look at cobalt 
in the uh, Mount Isa region in particular. And what we found um, from the assay results, and that's what you're looking at here, is that there is indeed a lot of cobalt sitting in our waste. And indeed, the place where we found the most endowed cobalt was sitting in the PICO deposit, which was actually a GA site. So I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about the results we found there. So PICO, um, obviously situated in the uh, Tennant Creek area, we went to that site, uh, I think, a couple of years ago now. And what we did was we undertook a, a hand augering survey. So that's what you're looking at here. That's Rosie Blenin sort of hand augering into one of our locations. You know, we, we hand augered probably about 10 or 11 holes, as you can see here. And we also undertook some grab sampling around this tailing storage facility. Now we can see it's, it's kind of delineated in a few different ways. And so we've got a sulfide rich area here highlighted in yellow. Um, but we also have kind of an area here that's already being reprocessed from a, a sump area. So we have a couple of different features within this TSF. But certainly, you know, hand augered into it, we got to a maximum depth of about 5.7 metres, which it, in reality was enough for us to get a nice snapshot of the variability of the tailings. So we can see there's not much in terms of hard pan going on here, but we can definitely see we've got into the sulfidic guts of the tailings sitting uh, at depth here. And certainly when we look at sort of the more you know, granular detail of the cobalt results, we can certainly see there are cobalt hotspots sitting in this sulfide rich area just here. And so there's big potential really for us to sort of think about cobalt extraction at this site. And if we dig into the mineralogy a little bit more, we can certainly see that in terms of dominant minerals, magnetite, quartz and pyrite, which was on average amongst 10 sort of chosen samples, it was about 5.38%. And if we look at how that pyrite is actually deported, we can see that that the P80 ranges from about 15 to 110 microns, which for us is within the realm of conventional flotation. So those methodologies could be available uh, to actually help do the mineral processing. But we have identified that these materials, the pyrite in particular, they are locked and they're associated, they're associated with other sulfides. So we would need to do a little bit of grinding and pre-treatment before it went through that flotation process. Now we can also see in terms of pyrite chemistry using laser ablation that we are actually quite well endowed in cobalt sitting within these pyrites. So our maximum cobalt values sitting in the pyrite were up to 1.5%. So you know, there's some pretty decent uh, values there in terms of pyrite endowment within um, cobalt endowment within the pyrite, as you can see. And when we actually think about how it's actually sitting within the pyrite lattice, we can see that for the most part, cobalt appeared refractory. And so for us, that kind of tells us that there could be a whole host of technologies available to actually recover that cobalt. So, for example, we could consider bioleaching uh, once we've done some conventional flotation to concentrate the sulfides. So, you know, these pieces of evidence that we've collected in this Stream 1 program has helped us to kind of benchmark and start to identify how indeed we can recover that value from that particular site. So those are some things to consider as you potentially could move to a Stream 3 program for this particular site. And, you know, if we do want to think about stream three programs across the tracks, we can certainly see that, you know, in Queensland, we've had a few opportunities to get involved in that in that space already. So thinking about Rocklands, for example, and that was one of the places that was sitting at 10 times crustal abundance. You know, we can see that, you know, we've worked with JOGMEG, the Japanese organisation uh, and the Queensland State Government and obviously Copper Resources Australia to develop a new methodology to extract that pyrite. And here it's um, a carrier flotation method. And that's undergoing patent right now. And that could be just the ticket to unlock uh, the cobalt resource that we have there in the Rocklands tailings. Another place where we tried a new technology was at the Osborne mine. So um, an ISDG deposit sitting up, at, I guess, in the Cloncurry area. And here, working with Cobalt Blue, we've kind of used their proprietary technology to do some test work to see if we can recover cobalt from the tailings, which again, is hosted in Pyrite, as with Rocklands, as with Pico. And at Pindora, now this is a place where the cobalt's hosted in a slightly different manner. And here it's hosted in uh, oxide materials, which is quite common around uh, the Northwest Mills province too. And so they've developed a new leach, leaching process or a new leach technology. And so we did some trials there. And what we saw was that we could more effectively recover cobalt and copper from these materials using their new proprietary technology. So I guess the other thing that we've seen through this program is that there's been a whole spate of new technology companies pop up developing technologies, particularly for mine waste materials, to recover this value. And I think collaborations with them are going to be very healthy to develop into the future to actually do that transformation of these waste features. Yeah, and we've also seen our PhD students get involved in this um, area too. So this is Laura Nichols, one of our MyWatch PhD students. And you can see here, she's actively doing some flotation test work in our labs. And so she was working at Capricorn Copper. So again, one of the sites that wasn't quite, you know, over 10 times crustal abundance for its cobalt, but it was getting there. 
but certainly Cobalt again hosted in Pyrite, and so she's looking at investigating flotation methods and others to see if we can recover the cobalt from those materials. So it really is also an area of science that's engaging with our ECRs, which is absolutely fantastic to see. And I think, you know, where's all this work going? You know, we've done a lot of work in Queensland and um, both through the GA program and indeed directly with the Queensland state government. So it's been great to see the federal government also extend funding grants directly to industry to help them in their operations look at sort of, you know, retrieving value from their mine waste. So for evolution mining, for example, in 2023, they were given $2.2 million from the federal government to actually help them look at extracting cobalt from mine waste at Ernest Henry. I'd like to think that some of the work that my watch did is, is kind of motivated some of that, but you know, we'll, we'll let someone else decide that. But certainly within our, our sort of state here in Queensland, um, just this just last year, in fact, at the World Mining Congress, it was announced that you know the government was going to be developing and supporting industry through the through these kind of direct grants to help explorers go out and look at their waste in a very similar manner to how my watch have been doing uh, with the Queensland government um, over the last little while. So it's great to see the empowerment for explorers to actually do this type of work and apply the kind of um, you know characterization methodologies we've been developing to actually understand um, their waste materials as well. So I think that's great. So in terms of where all this data is going, uh, obviously, We've generated a lot of data across the country and the intended destination for it is in the Atlas of Australian Mine Waste. And so version one of this came out last year and was very well received. And so what we'd like to do working with GA and other partners is to put this data into the back end of this for version two. And what this will do is this will give pre-competitive data for investors seeking critical metal waste sites across Australia. But for us as geoscientists, it would generate new knowledge of our Australian ore deposit waste signatures and indeed give us an opportunity to understand their processability. And now this is all really important. We've developed all this data to think about what's where, but now we actually have to think about modelling these resources. And we're only going to be able to model those resources if we actually think about how those tailing storage facilities and other waste features are actually deposited. And so this has been a challenge that Monash University led by Stuart have been undertaken over the last little while. And you know, this is gonna really help us actually understand the mineral resource potential that we truly have sitting already on our Australian landscape. And earlier this year, it was really exciting for us here at UQ to host the first Australian Mine Waste Symposium in collaboration with the Queensland State Government. So we were well sponsored by Geoscience Australia. And what we had the opportunity to do was to bring together 160 practitioners from across Australia and beyond and we got to sit down and talk about key issues when it comes to think about mine waste characterization and reprocessing. So areas of policy, of technology, of investigation, so many different topics. And what we'd like to see is this conversation continue into the future, because there are many, many topics left to unpack and indeed many opportunities for us to get together and explore how we can actually turn these liabilities into future assets for Australia. So that's probably enough for me today but thank you very much for your time and listening and before I go I'd just like to acknowledge the My Watch team so without their hard efforts traipsing across the country visiting all these different My Way sites we would not have been able to collect the volume of uh, information that we have today and in particular Kambawani so thank you very much. Well thank you Anita. Uh, given this is a, a new and emerging field, the scale of mine waste assessment that you and your team um, and the broader geoscience community have been undertaking is really inspirational and it's really great to see it starting to bear fruit. Um, so next up for our final talk in the session, we'll hear from Dr. Eleanor Lebro on environmental, social and governance mapping of the Australian mining sector, a critical review of spatial data sets for decision making. Uh, Eleanor is a Senior Research Fellow with the Centre for Social Responsibility in Mining at the University of Queensland. Eleanor specialises in environmental, social and governance, or ESG, um, risks in the global mining industry. She works with government and industry, mobilising ESG data from various sources and across multiple scales to aid in decision making. Thank you, Eleanor. Hello, uh, my name is Eleanor Lebre, I work at the Sustainable Minerals Institute at the University of Queensland. Uh, today I'm presenting a project that's about ESG factors and how these can be mapped at the scale of Australia. Uh, 
uh, to inform the uh, Australian mining sector. This project is a collaboration between UQ, uh, Geoscience Australia and Monash University. I am the um, lead on the, the, this part of the project on ESG. My colleague Laura Sonter is in charge of the deep dive on biodiversity. Um, we have with this project on ESG, uh, Environmental, Social and Governance, which is a very short acronym uh, when you consider the breadth of topic uh, that are covered with this acronym. So we've been working uh, on this project for about a year now, uh, uh, but we think it's just very the very beginning of a reflection on ESG in the mining sector. I should mention that uh, we've reached out to quite a few experts from the Sustainable Minerals Institute as part of this project to get their expertise on uh, various uh, parts of the ESG uh, spectrum. So I'll quickly talk about the context, uh, global context first, then I'll uh, talk about what really uh, spatial ESG is. Uh, and then I'll go to the core of our uh, work that has been about reviewing spatial data sets available for Australia. And I'll give two examples of how we can utilize these data sets and then I'll move to conclusions. So very briefly about the global context, uh, I'm sure you've heard there is a global energy transition going on and um, you probably also have heard about the link between uh, this transition and the mining industry with the need of quite a big amounts of different minerals and metals needed in, in different technologies uh, and uh, renewable energy infrastructure as well. So I won't go into uh, the details, I'm sure you've heard about this. Uh, but Australia is in a quite unique position to become a global supplier of these different energy transition minerals and metals. Uh, it has a very mature mining sector, very strong exploration um, sector, and uh, a very rich and diverse mineral resources. So uh, policymakers want to ensure that this in the increase in demand for these minerals and metals will generate long-lasting benefits for Australian. Um, doesn't disadvantage uh, certain communities or generate lasting social and environmental legacies and broadly aligns with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So what is geospatial ESG or ESG mapping? Uh, I'm guessing you've heard about the acronym ESG, but you probably haven't heard about this particular uh, approach on ESG. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time to explain that. So geospatial ESG is just quite simply the recognition that location matters when it comes to mining. Um, for example, here you have very constructing uh, context here. You have Divik on the left, which is in northern Canada. Uh, you have Escondida in the middle, uh, which is at 3000 meters of altitude in the Atacama Desert in uh, Chile. And on the right side, you have green bushes, which is here in Australia. You see there is a local town. You see that there is um, agriculture and uh, forests around. So when you look at these maps, it's quite clear that developing and operating these mines is quite influenced uh, by the context in which they are located. So ESG mapping is understanding that location uh, influences a site's ultimate social and environmental impacts. It also influences what impact mitigation strategies can be um, utilized and how effective they may be. It influences mine planning because you cannot develop a mine in isolation from its context. Uh, and also uh, location can influence mining development and in that sense uh, it can represent a risk sometime to mining development. So we've seen quite a few examples of projects that were uh, halted or delayed uh, because of some interactions with the local uh, geographic context or the regional context. So we've done quite a bit of work in this space, particularly on that issue of, of risk. Uh, I'm referencing here one of our first paper on this topic. So basically the ESG mapping approach, generally how it works. So on the one side, we have maps of mining projects with their location. Uh, and on the other side, we, we mobilize a set different sets of, of spatial data uh, that we uh, aggregate together uh, into different ESG categories. And I have referenced here one of the papers where we, I guess, have mobilized uh, all of these data sets together into quite a um, broad set of ESG indicators. 
So before, just to make sure that we understand what ESG mapping is with regards to some other ESG aspects that you may have heard of. So special ESG is not ESG performance or practice. So I'll give the example here of re water resources, which is a simple example. So in this context, special ESG would be, we would be using water stress data set, for example. Uh, and we would ask the question, is this deposit located in an area of high baseline water stress? Uh, we could also look at the global map. And for example, in our work, we have found that 65% of undeveloped copper resources are located in high water risk areas. So that's the type of work that we do with special ESG. ESG performance, on the other side, is a company will disclose the total water withdrawn from a, a site, for example, or the total water discharged uh, out of a mine site. Practice is how a company will recover or recycle water from processing, or whether a company uh, builds a desalination plant and shares water with other local users. So that's practice. So what I'm saying is that special ESG is about the external conditions around the project. It's about pre-existing conditions. And then companies and operators uh, have to deal with these initial conditions. And then, um, uh, yeah, based on that, establish some, um, some practice. So, so now I'm going to the work that we did for this project, where basically instead of using doing the global scale work that we did in the past, we really focus on data sets available for Australia. So in this review, uh, we focus, as I said, on national data sets. So basically, we don't use our global data sets and just part of it and, and apply it for Australia. And we also don't use local or regional data sets that just cover a small portion of the territory. So that's that's our frame. Key considerations for this review was, so data sets, of course, should be relevant to inform mining and exploration stakeholders. We also consider their readiness for use, whether we can mobilize them without having to do too much work on them. Uh, and we also consider data quality, including precautions and limitations for use. And we discuss all of these considerations in the, in the paper that we uh, are writing on this topic. So, so this is the final list that we have. We have about 30 data sets. Of course, there is much more out there. I, I know that there are quite a few government initiatives like the, the Digital Earth Australia or the Digital Atlas of Australia, uh, who've done a, a great job at compiling different data sets. Uh, so in for our project, we really selected those that we think have particular relevance to the uh, mining um, industry. So we have organized them in six uh, themes, but uh, today I'll just talk about the first two themes because I don't have the time to go through all of them. So the first one is the people theme. Um, so for this theme, we found very rich socioeconomic data uh, thanks to the national census. Everything is available at the, on the ABS website. And there's also very high resolution uh, population data population density, um, which uh, is, is a very good base. Uh, and and the good thing as well with ABS data is that it ha it's already aggregated into topics, which helps a lot with uh, interpretation. So different measures can be put together into, into different topics. So you can see here, for example, the socioeconomic disadvantage index, some measures put together around income or employment. Um, regarding the interpretation of this data, uh, overall, we think that um, these are not, most of them are not really measures of risk. So if we consider risk to development or risk to to, to uh, local stakeholders, apart from, I guess, risk to, if you have, I guess, you look at the population density data set and you see that they are uh, basically in a location, you have a village or people living directly close to a deposit, then that's a direct risk. Uh, for these people, there is a risk of having to resettle them, or if they stay nearby, there is potentially a health and safety risk. So, so that could be a measure of risk. But apart from that, uh, I think all of the other data sets are more descriptive, we would call them. So it's part of what the data that a mining company would want to access to better understand who 
who is located nearby, who is the local community, part of the company uh, uh, having to establish a social knowledge knowledge base. And establishing this knowledge base will ultimately help them reduce risks. We also see that some of these data sets uh, can be measures of vulnerability. So understanding the vulnerability of uh, the social context around the mining project. So for example, the socioeconomic disadvantage one is a measure of vulnerability. Uh, if you look at remoteness as well, and we know that remote communities typically will tend to lack uh, some public services or uh, um, be quite difficult to access. Uh, so that's also measures of, measures of vulnerability. More generally, the people data sets, uh, they are very valuable uh, for companies that would like to evaluate the resources and capabilities they need to enter a certain area once they understand really uh, um, who is the local community. Uh, with water resources, uh, it's quite different. So I think it's interesting to look at these two themes because they are really uh, different in terms of the data that's available. When we started to look at this particular theme, we thought based on the work that we did globally that water resources is very high mapping potential. Um, it, it, there is quite a, a few very good data sets globally. Uh, but when we looked at the scale of Australia, we realized that um, in, in Australia, um, access to water and questions of water availability primarily depends on state level regulation. Uh, and unfortunately, some of the key data that we would need to access to really thoroughly answer the question of water is in water plans, and water plans are not in a spatial format. So that's a bit of a limitation for this theme. But uh, apart from that, we have still found quite a few data sets that are relevant. Uh, many of them connect more quickly compared to the, the people theme, connect more quickly to the questions of economic viability and risk. So you can see, for example, surface water features can be linked to understanding the requirements for water diversion and water diversion away from uh, mining activities can be quite costly and, and directly connect with the question of economic viability. Uh, and more generally, uh, water, uh, these water data sets are also very appropriate for uh, evaluating uh, resources and capabilities needed uh, to enter a particular area. So key takeaways from this review overall, a very rich diversity of data sets uh, relevant to the mining sector. Um, we highlight a few challenges that we need to address before being able to, to move ahead. So one of them is accessibility uh, issues. So I mentioned the, the issue of water plants. There is also a few weather uh, data sets that are not downloadable directly. And uh, something that was pointed out by many of the experts that we talked to for this project, these national data sets are not for use in local decision making. So uh, there is also when company does environmental or social impact assessment, they have to gather local data. These national scale data sets are not for this purpose. So uh, that's important to distinguish different usage between a national data set and local data set. And the other set of challenges that we identified uh, is around interpretation. So because of course these data sets were not designed with the mining industry in mind. So uh, when we interpret them, we have to ask what role do these different data sets play for example, in, in mining development. So uh, we have, for example, the question of risk. Does Do, do some uh, spatial factors play a role as acting as a, as a risk or as a constraint to development, for example? Overall, uh, we think that there is a need for developing guidance and use cases around the use of these data sets for uh, the mining industry. There is also a risk of data overload because there's quite a bit of data and the human brain is not really uh, equipped to grasp the complexity of all this very easily. So aggregation into uh, a smaller set of metrics, uh, composite metrics, is needed as well. Now, I just want to talk a little bit because we've done a bit of work to try to use these different data sets uh, and particularly around the topic of risk to development and testing the relationship between special ESG data sets and uh, mining and exploration. For example, so we looked at the connection between delays in development and land tenure. And you can see from these two graphs, on the left side, we have quite a clear influence of economic factors. So tier one deposits, as you can see from this graph here, they 
get developed faster. The time, the delays is much shorter than tier two deposits or tier three deposits and tier four deposits tend to develop much slower. So that's a clear influence of economic factors here. Uh, whereas when you look at land tenure, you can see that most different types of land tenure are really gathered around the, the average. And so it seems like in this case, land tenure doesn't seem to have a very big role in delays. So that's one of the analysis that we did. I should also mention the work from my colleagues that are focusing on biodiversity. Uh, and they looked at biodiversity and permit approval in Queensland, and they found similar results. So mining and biodiversity hotspots in Queensland do not seem to overlap, and approval times have remained constant over time. And you can see here that endangered wildlife habitat or the number of threatened species doesn't seem to play a role in permitting approval and the number of days needed. So it's very flat uh, here. So that's some of the work that we've done trying to uh, see if there is a connection between um, uh, some mining development constraints and, and some ESG data sets. Another part of the work that we've done was around aggregation. And when we look at aggregation, we first wanted to uh, set some basic principles of things that we need to be careful about when we aggregate. Uh, we think that aggregation is a necessary step towards decision making. But also when we aggregate and we produce a heat map, for example, like the one you, ca you can see here, there is also a risk to reach uh, simplistic conclusions. So it's important to include a disaggregated visualization of the results as well at, at the same uh, next to the heat map, which is what I'm showing here, for example, that's an example of a spider chart. It's also when you, we aggregate, it's also very important to look at the meaning of aggregation. So because data sets have their own meaning, they were assembled and built around the meaning. But we, when we aggregate different data sets together, then we lose that meaning. So it's important to aggregate around a specific question uh, and select the data sets according to that question. And then to have use cases and guidance around how aggregation can be done around these specific questions. So, and the last point is when we aggregate, it's very important as well to acknowledge which dimension are left out because uh, when we aggregate around a certain question, there are always some dimensions of that question that cannot be aggregated either because they are not mappable simply or because the data set uh, is not available for this particular uh, dimension. So the work that we did on aggregation, I want to mention that, yeah, we did a, an, an example using Pareto ranking method, which helps to identify a set of good projects at, under a range of competing criteria. So this work uh, was done by our collaborator at Monash. I have referenced here some of their work. So Stuart Walsh and his team proposed to treat early stage exploration decisions as multi-criteria optimization problems, which and used Pareto ranking methods for this purpose. In our example, we looked at context vulnerability. I've mentioned a little bit vulnerability before, but we looked at social and environmental vulnerability using a set of a selection of data sets. But because we looked at vulnerability, we used a reverse Pareto ranking method. So instead of identifying best project, we identified most vulnerable locations. You can see um, the bottom left graph here. That's the example of the reverse Pareto rank method. Uh, you can see here um, the way to interpret it is here the, the nickel and gold projects are overall located in less vulnerable contexts than um, other commodities. So, so as a conclusion, uh, we think that ESG mapping has a value as com pre-competitive pool of knowledge to serve early stage decision making for companies, for example, who would want to compare different locations across Australia or compare a location relative to Australian average. We also think that um, it has value for policymakers who want to better understand the Australian territory uh, and perhaps target certain locations and uh, identify these locations for uh, specific policies. We think that the mining industry will probably have quite a bit of interest in understanding aspects related to risk to business, whether ESG factors play a role in, in risks. 
But we think we can go beyond that as well. And the ASG mapping approach can provide much more than that. Uh, overall, uh, more work needed is just the very beginning. We've been working on this for just a year now. Um, and again, a very broad topic to explore. We don't want to put the cart before the horse. Uh, we think there's quite a bit of foundation work that needs to be done. Thank you for your attention. And the paper on this topic will be available through my Google Scholar profile. Well, thanks a lot, Eleanor, for broadening our horizons to a to a new and emerging field and, you know, a really important field. We all want to um, develop new resources, but we all want to do it responsibly um, in, in a way that's going to, you know, do the right thing by ESG standards. So um, I think it's clear that by starting to explore this field that there's a lot more research and careful thinking to be done. Um, but one, one thing that is clear is that there's really a fantastic opportunity to use spatial data to inform decision making in the ESG field. So, so really excellent. Thank you. Um, so that brings us to our question and answer session today. Um, unlike other sessions, uh, our presenters are here online um, ready to answer your questions on their talks. Um, so, you know, we're getting vibes of 2020 here again. Um, so if you have a question, please add it in the Q&A panel on your screen and make sure that you include the name of the presenter that you'd like to ask the question of when you do. Um, so to kick things off, I just want to begin with a question for all of the presenters. How do you think that you can learn from each other's work and integrate your findings to inform a more holistic view of Australia's potential for critical minerals? Uh, Ariane, maybe I'll pass to you first. Sure. Uh, thanks for the question. I guess uh, a really important aspect is learning from the mine waste and what the different buy and co products are in the different mineral systems so that as we're moving towards doing these commodity based potential maps, we understand which systems need to be integrated to understand the different potential for the different commodities. So that's going to be really important from a mineral systems understanding point of view. Um, and in terms of the ESG, uh, I think it's really important to understand that and integrate that with uh, the, mineral, the geological based mineral potential maps as well as uh, sort of the techno-economic modelling under economic fairways because just because an area has geological potential doesn't mean it's going to be able to get developed if, for example, that geological potential happens to be in a world heritage area. So we want to make sure that these... Uh, sort of areas of high prospectivity actually also have a high chance of development. So being able to integrate those different models around ESG, economic fairways and mineral potential sort of gives us more confidence that the project's actually going to be able to get developed in a responsible way. Thanks, Ariane. Um, Anita, what, what have you got to contribute from the, the mine waste perspective? Yeah, um, you know, echo what Ariane said there. I mean, there's you know, really great ways to integrate, as, as she's pointed out. But I think one area that I'd also like to draw some attention to is, I mean, looking at the work that Ariane and the team have done, we've got this opportunity now to think about future mines and how we can actually start to sort of predict what we should do with future mine waste. And I think that's a really important part of this conversation as well. So, you know, if we can apply the, the skills that Eleanor uh, showed through her presentation, start thinking about you know the future mapping of those uh, deposits, um, the signatures of those wastes, and what we can do to kind of extract those byproducts earlier on in the piece, um, and then reduce that waste, that waste footprint from the outset. We've got a real opportunity to do that now. Um, Technology is enabling all of these different projects, integrating the change the way we should approach one in the next one in the next so years. So it's really great. Yep, excellent. Thank you, Anita. Um, and Eleanor, I see you've uh, joined us with your camera on. Um, so, you know, we've, um, Ariane and Anita have sort of spoken from the, the resources perspective. What, um, how do you see ESG um, data integrating with, um, with providing a more holistic view of, of our critical minerals future? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, I think so. Uh, to add to Arian, what Arian was saying, I think. Uh, you know, it just resonated with me when you were talking about certain things in your presentation area and that, you know, so, some deposits, you can expect them to be, you know, small footprint deposits, where, whereas other would be large footprints. Well, if you integrate this knowledge with ESG data on top of it, you can really understand, um, you know, the full picture of uh, maybe, yeah, understanding the context uh, and in which these 
large pre-deposit would develop uh, and understanding the level of risk or vulnerability uh, that can be found pre-existing levels in that context. Uh, and, and I also think with the work of Anita, uh, so because the work of Anita is really about characterizing the inside of a mine footprint uh, and understanding, uh, whereas my work whereas is my work understanding is what's outside of the mine footprint. So really understanding the interface between a mine and its context as well. So, so I think the geography uh, perspective and using maps is uh, generally very good potential for integrating all of the different types of data together. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely a uh, multi-piece puzzle, and it's really fantastic to see all these different strands, um, different perspectives starting to come together. So thank you for that. Um, so uh, the first question we have from um, is from Anonymous. Uh, thank you, Anonymous. Um, so uh, thanks for a great talk, Ariane. Um, why is it that the Mount Isa Cloncurry district appears to rank higher than the Olympic domain? I guess um, we're, we're talking about the ICG mineral potential map. Um, and, you know, what is the actual evidence for, for prospectivity for IOCG um, in the Yilgarn or Halls Creek districts? So over to you, Ariane. Thanks. Uh, that's a really great question and is something that we uh, acknowledge exists uh, that there is higher prospectivity in the uh, IOCG mineral potential map in uh, Kloncurry uh, rather than uh, sort of, it's higher than it is in the Gola Kraton in around Olympic Dam. The reason for that is the statistical methodology that we used. And so in the, in the methodology, all of the IOCG deposits and occurrences have been treated equally. So we haven't weighted I'm Olympic weighted. Dam higher than uh, an occurrence that might occur in Cloncurry. But uh, even though Olympic Dam in the Gola is obviously a very, very large deposit. Um, there are actually more IOCG occurrences in the Cloncurry district. So the statistics do tend to have a slight bias towards the uh, mineralisation in Cloncurry. That's something we're aware of and is something that we're going to look at how to address in future assessments and how we might be able to weight our training data to more effectively capture the different sizes of the deposits that we use in the assessment. Um, so that hasn't been done in this study, but we're aware of it and is something that we are going to seek to address. Uh, the second part of the question around um, sort of what is the evidence for the prospectivity in the Yilgarn and Halls Creek? Uh, well, basically the statistical assessment looked at uh, where the correlations were with the different data sets and um, the Yilgarn and Halls Creek have similar characteristics in some cases or a lot of cases, particularly in Halls Creek, to the regions that actually do host the IOCG mineralisation that we're aware of. And so um, because, uh, the, because of those similarities to the known IOCG districts, it's highlighting uh, in particular Halls Creek. The Yilgarn does have some similarities, but probably just not as many as Halls Creek. So that's why we're seeing Halls Creek come up as being highly prospective, even though there's not any currently identified IOCG mineralization there. So it's opening up, potentially opening up a new region to look for IOCG uh, mineralization. Yep, thank you, Ariane. I think the real advantage of the approach that you outlined is you know, really leveraging those pre-competitive data sets to, you know, to, to map processes and understand, you know, not not so much fleshing out the areas we already know, but asking questions of well, wh where else has these processes going on? So, yeah, really good. Um, so this question is for Anita. Um, so for new mining projects coming online, is there any support to help mining companies look into minimising mine waste to extract the sorts of minerals that, that we want um, before they go into the mine waste? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, and that's that's really quite a big question to, to answer because I suppose different uh, states, there's different approaches and different levels of support. So uh, one thing I can draw attention to certainly is in Queensland, there's support for explorers going back to look at existing mine waste materials and sort of characterise the potential resources that might be there in terms of critical metals. So that's a new fund that came online. Doesn't necessarily help in terms of what this question is asking. 
But one thing I should also draw attention to is that, you know, as you know, places like the SMI have developed new approaches to characterizing all bodies through geometallurgy, we're seeing opportunities to do that byproduct recovery earlier in the piece. So one major sort of initiative that came out of uh, the SMI was all sands, where essentially it's looking at, you know, we've obviously got this deficiency of sand production globally. And one potential area where we could kind of replace the need for SANS is through characterizing our raw bodies properly, uh, using all the sort of the technologies, taking a geomet approach to characterization and working out if that can be kind of recovered earlier in the piece rather than being sent out to, to mine waste. So, you know, companies are, you know, coming on board in terms of thinking about that geomet approach to characterization. And there is more intrinsic appetite to sort of look at additional commodities that could be produced once mining commences. So I think there's there's a lot of initiatives and drivers being taken within companies. Um, I think right now we're seeing a lot of the government support to deal with the existing mine waste, but certainly there is um, there is a lot of uh, growing interest in sort of doing that, you know, multi-commodity um, recovery earlier in the piece as well. Um, so I guess one thing to tackle at a time, let's start with the existing mine waste, yeah. Yeah, fantastic, Anita. And, you know, Aside from whatever policy mechanisms might be available, um, you know, really, I suppose our role as geoscientists is to um, provide the data and, and and decision support tools to to facilitate the development of, of a mine waste industry. And I think I think you're really right in here. I think one of the really exciting parts about critical minerals is looking at our existing ore deposits and thinking, well, you know, what other what other secret herbs and spices can we get out of them? What other goodies are there that we're, we're not um, taking taking advantage of and getting the full value out of? So thank you for that. Um, so this is a question for all of the panelists from um, Sarah Buckerfield. So thank you, Sarah. Um, so first of all, thanks for wonderful presentations. Um, the impacts of a metals-based energy system are real, as, as you've all shown, um, but the science as a whole shows that done as responsibly as we can, this is the best path for keeping the planet habitable and achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Do you have any thoughts on how we can better communicate this cumulative science to minimise the influence of groups um, that maybe aren't quite assessing the whole picture? Um, so there's, there's a bit in that question. So um, who would like to go first? Uh, I can tackle but first, I guess. Um, so I think that's a really interesting question. And I think by producing these integrated products, which look at where the geological potential is, where the ESG uh, risks or opportunities are, um, and sort of providing that integrated holistic product and communicating it in an effective way uh, so that those ESG considerations are already built into the modelling. Um, that may be one way to minimise uh, sort of the impact of people not looking at the whole picture by putting those kind of uh, integrated assessments out uh, for uh, public consumption. That's just one idea. Um, to you. Uh, yeah, I just can complement that a bit because I think that question is particularly relevant with the ESG data sets because I think that many people will want to get a lot out of these data sets. Uh, and I think that's why it's so important to not just provide the data, but also provide information and knowledge around that data. So developing use cases um, and, and using aggregation because aggregation into of data sets different diff together uh, is really something that helps with communication. Uh, it can help building narratives and explaining uh, things to different types of audiences. So, so I do think there is a lot of groundwork to do, not just distributing the data or making that data available, but, but building those use cases and explaining different things. So uh, great potential there, I think. Uh, it's always hard to uh, communicate about ESG because I think ESG uh, has yeah has become quite politicized. So uh, it's all the more important to emphasize communication. Yep, Anita. Yeah, I think both great. It's it's hard to go last, isn't it? Everyone says such great things. Um, I mean, on the communication front, I mean, you know, I think the work you know forums like this are fantastic, and you know, this is very accessible um, after the fact as well. Um, you know, just taking a bit of a, taking this uh, question in a slightly different direction. I mean, you know, I think as a, as a whole, you know, there's been a lot of push within the geoscience community to sort of get out into the community and talk about the opportunities around 
you know, critical metals and minerals. Um, you know, we saw uh, Digging Deep for a couple of years ago on the television and your own Alison Britt, uh, part of that program as well, which was great. Um, but, you know, we are seeing kind of more and more normalization around sort of the growing need for critical minerals mining within our country. And I think, you know, part of that conversation has been sort of looking at it, you know, in both the positives and the negatives and sort of addressing where there might be potential negatives, how we, you know, as a community can work through those. And certainly the work that Eleanor is doing is sort of very much speaking to really understand what those ESG risks will look like. And the fact that we have these platforms that are accessible, like there's really nice GUIs, people can go in, they can interact. It's not so esoteric that it's some weird data set with formulas that no one can digest. Like the, the you know, the, the products that, that GA you've developed and, um, you know, they're so amazing, you know, anyone can interact with those. You know, I've got children in high school and, you know, even they're sort of talking about some of the things that they see in, in this kind of context. And that's really exciting. So I think, you know, as we do integrate the, the data sets, we get those GUIs, you know, working with groups like Oscope, Lithodata, et cetera, we just make it more accessible for people to understand the data. And if they understand the data, they can then sort of really start to understand the risks and, you know, what that impact might be on a very local level, on a regional level and on a national level as well. And I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think it's... It's, it's moving in the right direction, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I think a couple of really good points made there. I think we're getting getting to the point where we can bring in so many different um, perspectives to support responsible resource development and, and you know, responsible decision making. You know, as you noted, you know, geoscience is a big part in the transition to net zero. So, you know, it's really exciting times ahead. And I think a number of you touched on the communication aspect, um, you know, which links really strongly to some of the themes we, we explored in in the first um, the first parts of this showcase around you know communicating the the, the so what to um, to the the general public so yeah really good points there um, so we might move on this question is for Eleanor from um, Cheryl Holtz so um, Eleanor it would be interesting to see the approvals graphs and others for New South Wales um, do you intend to do similar studies in New South Wales. Um, so that question would be more for my uh, um, colleague, Laura Sunter, who is doing the deep dive on that biodiversity. But I want to point out that the, so the deep dive on biodiversity is uh, is, is still ongoing. So this uh, there's going to be more results coming out of this stream. And I'm sure uh, that Laura will be communicating about this as well in different ways. So so I would say. I would say yes, I don't want to answer for her, uh, but I know that she's looking at the whole uh, Australian territory, right? So she's not focusing just on Queensland. Uh, and uh, and I think, yeah, so I think that's also, and there is another question from Mark later that also asked about uh, the question on biodiversity. Um, I, I think the, co the biodiversity question is a complex one. Uh, like, I think all of those themes, they have very complex questions and different, as you said, uh, very different, um, uh, measures that can lead to different results. Uh, so uh, the, that's why the deep dive on biodiversity is really important. And I think we also need some deep dives on the other themes as well, hopefully uh, at some point. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, so lots of work going on, but still lots of work to do. Mm -hmm. um, this one's for Anita, also from Cheryl. Um, so um, will you be doing more research into coal mine tailing waste um, at operational mines um, in New South Wales again? Mm -hmm. Um, so basically, you know, have you got plans to do more sites in New South Wales? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, we have wrapped up our program with uh, New South Wales for now, where we looked at 21 sites. So 11 uh, were coal sites and 10 were metalliferous. And so that's, um, that's a data set that's going to be um, published, I think, in the next couple of months. So we're just doing final touches to that. So, yeah, we only looked at 11 sites there. Um, love to go back. Certainly, um, there was um, a big pro program we funded by ACOP that CSIRO were leading, looking at sort of coal waste signatures in Queensland and in New South Wales. So, you know, I guess coupled with their data set, um, I guess we are sort of building knowledge around the critical mineral sort of content of some of those waste materials. But I think, you know, we, well, one thing that we shouldn't forget is, you know, if we don't necessarily find that there's a critical metal or mineral. Uh, outcome or potential in those uh, materials. The other bend or flex we can sort of start thinking about is material science. So, you know, in a lot of um, in a lot of the sites that we studied, you know, we actually thought that perhaps some of the better opportunities might be sort of into geopolymers or the development of aggre aggregate materials rather than necessarily critical minerals. So, I guess when we think about valorization, we started these programs motivated to find critical metals and minerals. 
but you know, it, through the 48 element assays and the multi mineralogy kind of scans that we've done, we have been sort of thinking about well, if that's not you know a reasonable outcome, that's if that's not an economic outcome, what could be the other options on the table? And for, for certainly the coal sites that we have studied in New South Wales, some of them seemed like that was perhaps a better flex for, for reuse opportunities. So yeah, probably gone on a bit there, Cheryl, but yeah, would love to go back. There's a lot more sites to get stuck into, and as things move towards uh, mine closure, it could be a more sensible option because we had seen some sniffs of vanadium, rare earth elements, uh, scanium as well. So yeah, could be some more potential out there. Great. And I think a really nice reminder that, as, as you say, Nita, it's not just about the metals. It's about real, um, you know, getting getting full value out of an asset and um, to support the circular economy. So yeah, re really good. Thank you. Um, this one's for Eleanor from J J sorry Jared Austin. Um, so Jared asks, ultimately, how do you see this work informing decision making? Um, would it be useful in helping to assess mining applications? So a pretty pretty big question there. Um, so over to you, Eleanor. Yeah. So I think um, yeah, we have to be careful with thinking about which data. Uh, we, we'd be using for this. So in terms of approval process, I, I do think that national data is not necessarily the one that we want to be using. Again, if it's about making local scale decisions, uh, there is a whole process of, you know, social and environmental impact assessment that is designed to collect data at the local scale, whereas national scale is, nat national scale data is appropriate for, I guess, yeah, uh, policy scale, uh, wanting to better understand the whole Australian territory as a whole and understanding where little pockets of uh, vulnerability or risk, for, for example, uh, should be further investigated. So it can be used as a way to identify places and narrow down on these places, uh, particularly uh, for targeted policy, maybe. Um, but and the other way national data uh, can be used is to compare compare locations. Uh, so uh, so yeah, so different types of use for national data than for local data. I hope that answers your question. I'm not a policymaker, so I don't know exactly uh, how data could be used. But I do I do think that uh, we can use ESG data at different scales. So national scale, I'm sure that also at the state level, because lots of decisions are made at the state level. So you need state level data sets uh, uh, that are already there and uh, and different types of decisions for local scale. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Eleanor. Um, so unfortunately, we'll have to draw the Q&A session to a close there. Um, so I just want to um, thank again, um, Ariane, Anita and Eleanor. Um, and thank you to everyone who's attended today's session. Um, if you have a question you'd still like to ask or you'd like to make contact, um, then you can do so. Uh, you can email us at eftf at ga.gov.au. Um, the good news is, even though we're at the end of today's proceedings, the showcase will continue tomorrow um, with a deep dive into our regional projects, including the Delamere in origin, the Kernamona province, Birundudu, West Musgrave, and Upper Darling Barker River floodplain. So um, if you're interested in tuning in tomorrow, and you definitely should, um, the first session begins at 10.30 a.m. with deep dives into the Delamere in. Um, if you haven't registered for tomorrow's session, it's not too late. Uh, you can find the link to register for day four um, on the showcase webpage. And if you missed anything from today's session or you'd like to rewatch something, um, the recordings um, from today will be available in the coming days on our showcase website webpage at ga.gov.au forward slash showcase. Um, so with that, I'll bring this to a close and we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow.